You've actually briefed Congress a couple of times on AI. How big a deal is this executive order? Uh, so I think that it's, we're yet to see how the impacts of the executive order play out, uh, but we're very excited to see the fact that the administration is declaring AI to be an important initiative. Uh, that if you look at other countries around the world, uh, you know, South Korea has a billion dollar initiative, France has invested $1.8 billion, many provinces in China are investing between one to two billion dollars each. And so if you look at the investment in AI around the world, it's something that the U.S. should be taking note of. China has actually accelerated, Ben, its investment in AI ten times in recent years. Is this all about U.S.-China competitiveness? Uh, well, the White House uh, sort of declined to uh, say that this was about China, but I think uh, the message was pretty clear. And I think it's also worth noting that you're talking about uh, these hard numbers, uh, China accelerating, you know, 10 times the funding that it's doing, uh, the provinces that uh, are funding it. We don't see anything like that uh, in this executive order. This is about uh, making R&D funding for uh, artificial intelligence a priority, uh, but they don't say how much of a priority it should be, and they don't... Uh, appropriate extra monies. Uh, no, of course, uh, the power of the purse is Congress. Uh, so we can't totally blame uh, the White House for not uh, putting money into this. But I, I do think it's worth noting uh, that they're not putting a lot of hard fundraising totals, uh, hard funding totals, or even suggesting them. Greg, what do you make of that? Uh, so, so I think that, that one thing that, that is worth keeping in mind with AI development is that to the extent that it becomes an arms race, uh, that's something that's actually very scary, right? That I think we've seen in recent years that even getting technologies that are very transformative uh, but where there aren't national stakes at, uh, at play, it's really hard to make sure that those are going to benefit society and play out in a good way. And so with AI development, I think that it's actually today more about making sure that we set up the international dynamics so that there's coordinated competition so that we can compete on applications but can actually coordinate on safety. And I think that the executive order actually does a good job of saying that, hey, we do need to coordinate internationally uh, and that this is something we need to pay attention to. We don't know exactly what magnitude yet. Interesting. I recently sat down with Kai Fu Lee, an AI expert. He used to run Google China before Google left the country. He had this to say about the comparison uh, uh, between the U.S. and China on AI. Take a listen. Research China is not going to surpass U.S. for another 20 years with, with or without any um, regulations. I mean, U.S. is just so far ahead in research. Uh, however, in implementation, China has everything it needs. There's nothing U.S. can do that will slow down China. So it's so, so kind of pointless in AI uh, to, to look at how to regulate. Ben, is coordinated competition really a possibility between the U.S. and China in the current environment? Uh, it remains uh, a, a little bit to be seen uh, how much they can really do that, uh, given what's going on here. I do think it's interesting that they're not uh, talking about uh, export controls or uh, IP, and that's something that the U.S. has uh, used to try and constrain uh, China on, uh, first of all, its tech ambitions, but also in this larger sort of escalating uh, trade war that we have here. Uh, and so in some ways, it doesn't talk about the larger competition between the U.S. and China for who's going to kind of uh, control the 21st century and the 20th second century uh, of tech right now. And I, I do think it's worth noting that uh, there's a lot less optimism than that, that the U.S. is going to be dominant uh, here in Washington. So to hear that, the, that uh, China is 20 years out, that's not something you hear a lot of. You hear a lot more warnings that uh, we're falling behind. Uh, and it's time to step up and really train that workforce and make those investments. China farther behind on research, though, but not on implementation. Is that an assessment, Greg, that you would agree with? I, I think that's actually pretty accurate. One thing that the U.S. does incredibly well is that we import talent from across the world. Uh, this is why the U.S. led in science in the 50s, 60s, 70s. If you look at OpenAI, we have, uh, I believe, 19 different native languages that people grew up speaking. So we really are able to get the best people from around the world. As long as we keep doing that, the U.S. is going to keep being ahead in all of the breakthroughs. I, I want to talk a little about the importance of building the workforce that uh, is going to be building the AI of the future. I also recently sat down with Genevieve Bell of Intel, who's done some work on, work on ethics and diversity in AI. Take a listen to what she had to say. I always think that the more voices you have in the room when you're making solutions and you're inventing the future, the more likely you are to find something that's compelling. So for me, the fact that study after study finds that men and women have completely different attitudes to privacy, to data, to security, means that unless we have all those voices in the room, we develop things that don't work for everyone. So, look, Greg, it's no secret that the tech industry is, you know, to, today very male-dominated. There have been a lot more focus on diversity initiatives. But 
will we be able to get the right sort of workforce in place to build the AI of the future and make sure that all pers perspectives are built into this new technology? So, so this question is very core to OpenAI's existence, that our goal is to make sure that, that artificial intelligence benefits everyone. And I think that on today's trajectory, uh, that, that we're not looking good on, on diversity and making sure that we have the right kind of people at the table. And so it's up to organizations, and this is one thing that we want to help push, but really it's the whole, whole industry's responsibility to make sure that we're helping to bring everyone in and to educate uh, the, the future workforce and stakeholders. Uh, and so we have, we have programs like OpenAI Scholars, uh, where we go and we educate people who are just coming into the field. Within three months, people can become core contributors. So Ben, in terms of implementation, what should we be looking Looking for next now that this executive order has been signed. Uh, well, there's a couple things. You know, where where is the money going to come from? Some of it might have to be uh, sort of reprogramming. If, if some of these agencies get a little more money, then they can probably uh, put the funding to that. But for right now, they're probably going to have to uh, locate it in their budgets, which I think is interesting. Uh, the other thing I'm watching is is uh, where is industry going to come? We heard uh, from a lot of folks, including IBM, who who kind of came out and said, you know, this is this is what we asked for. This is really what we wanted. This is the uh, targeted uh, funding and education. Uh, I, I think they probably would want a little bit more of that. Uh, but that's another thing that I'm going to be watching. And then maybe a third thing is going to be uh, how do you train the workforce, not just for the folks who are going to be doing uh, AI in the future, uh, but those people who are going to be losing their jobs when, uh, when they're automated by, by these softwares.